You got some extra exercise this morning, didn't you? Yeah. Well, we are in John chapter 21. Um, there is, a, there is a, an outline in your bulletin, but also there will be things up on the screen. Um, I want to say thank you to you. I mean, I've had so many people come up to me and say, thank you for going through these passages in John and over the Holy Week of every night and everything. I just have to say it right back to you. I'm so thankful I got to do it. You know, just that opportunity to dive deep into John and his, his view of everything that's going on and his recording of what Jesus has said. And so it kind of made it easy. Last Sunday, we covered John chapter 20. And now just to say, hey, there's one more chapter in the, ver in the book. So let's go to John chapter 20, 21. And I was trying to think as I was going through this this week, how can this be memorable or how to remember it? And then it was like, it's remember. Um, the, the phrase, this has happened before. So as we go through this passage of Scripture, you're, if, you, if you know your Bible, if you've been familiar with it, you're going to read some things and go, wait, this has happened before. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do five different remembers as we walk through this passage of Scripture. So as we start in chapter 21, starting in verse 1, after these things, so I stop right there and just say that most likely now it's a couple weeks later um, after, after Jesus has risen from the grave, uh, and we'll find the disciples up uh, in Galilee again now. After these things, Jesus manifested himself. Manifested again means he made himself visible to someone. Made himself, manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's interesting that John calls it the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias is the same as the Sea of Galilee. Is the same as the Lake of Gennesaret. I'm like, man, three different names for this body of water. But if you were from the east side of the Sea of Galilee, you would call it the Lake of Gennesaret. If you were an Israelite, you would have called it the Sea of Galilee. If you were a Roman, you would have called it the Sea of Tiberias because it actually got changed to that to honor Tiberius Caesar. There was actually a, a, a settlement, a city that was built on the Sea of Galilee um, in honor of him. So it's interesting that John, writing later, he calls it the Sea of Tiberias is so that those in the Roman world would know where he's talking about this was happening. Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. He says, Simon Peter, now I would just, I'll stop right there. I'm going to like stop all the time here. Simon Peter, um, we know that Simon is his birth name. Peter is his Jesus given name, okay, or Cephas. Um, so every once in a while, John, when he's recording, he'll say Simon Peter. Sometimes he'll just say Simon. And sometimes he'll just say Peter. But then sometimes he says Simon Peter. And I just kind of wonder at times if he's trying to indicate something there. That if sometimes Simon acts like Simon before he knew Christ. And sometimes Simon acts like Peter after he knew Christ. But then there's sometimes when Simon Peter acts, acts like he's in the middle. He's on defense. We, Simon Peter, he's, you know, there's before and after, and he's kind of in the middle here. So he says, Simon Peter, and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, we know them to be James and John, and, the other dis and two other disciples were together. So we got seven there. We got seven disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. They caught nothing. Now, that, that's, a, that's reminder number one. They caught nothing. This has happened before. This has happened before. If you want to flip over to Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 5, th about three, three and a half years earlier, this is Peter's first um, encounter with Jesus. And as we Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 1, it says, Now it happened that while the crowds were pressing around him, around Jesus, and listening to the word of God, he was standing on the edge of the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, 
Uh, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, and the fishermen, having gotten out of them, were washing their nets because they would have fished all night. The last thing they do before they go home is they take care of their nets and get them all straightened out, ready for the next night. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put a little way from land. And he sat down and began teaching the crowds from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we've labored all night and caught nothing. See, there it is. It, it, this has happened before to Peter. But by your word, he goes, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And just take a little note of that. That that time, the nets began to break. And, and what happens next? So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they, be, and they came and they filled both boats and they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. So he, right at the very start, he realizes Jesus is somebody special. Really special. Got to be special. Whoa, just look what just happened. And, I, and I'm not worthy to be in his presence. Verse 9, For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were partners with Simon, who also were amazed. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed him. Now, let's go back to our passage of Scripture in chapter 21. So, this has happened before, that they've been out all night and they haven't caught anything. Verse 4, back in 21. But when the day was now breaking, because that's what they would do, they would fish at night, and then in the morning what they would do is they would take all the fish that they had and they would take it to market. So as it was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So they see a guy, on, it's just a guy on the beach. There's a guy on the beach. Did you see that? There's a guy over there on the beach. There's a guy on the beach, you know. Yeah, there's a guy on the beach. Verse 5. So Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? Now it's interesting, he calls them children. He calls these grown men who have been fishing all night. He calls them children. It's not children as an infant. It's not that word. But it's children as someone who is still under the care of their parents and not mature. Um, someone that would still be under the age of, in their culture, under 13. Um, but he calls these grown men who have been fishing all night and caught nothing, he calls them children. Hey, hey, you know. So that's kind of odd that he does that. And they answer him, no. And, and it's emphatic that, that like, like, no. No, wait guy on the beach the guys on the beach always have these opinions and so in verse 6 he says and he said to them cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some not that you'll find all but you'll find some if you do this and so they cast and when they were not able to haul in the fish because and they were not able to haul in because of the great number of fish now i have a story to tell here because there's always a guy on the beach we were camping one time uh, with our kids, and in this campground, there was like this little lagoon that went out into the lake. And it was really great because you could back your boat into the lagoon, get the motor running, and, and then go out into the lake. So here I got all four kids in the boat, along with Stephanie, and everything, back the boat into the lagoon, and I start pulling on the motor, and it's, it's, yeah, I can't get it started, and everything. Well, after that sound, that motor sound, just draws people. And all of a sudden, all along the lagoon, all these guys standing out there, giving me all their opinion. Why? Did you choke it? Did you, it sounds flooded to me. I think we'd... And they start talking amongst themselves. I'm just like, oh, you know. It's in stereo coming both ways and everything. I never did get the motor started. You know, I just finally just rode back in, you know, and said, we'll do this later kind of thing. But it kind of gives you the feeling like, okay, he just called us kids. And we said, no. And then, but for some reason, when he said, cast it on the right side of the boat, we did so. And here is this whole bunch of fish that we have. So in verse 7, therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved, we know that that's code word for John, said to Peter, 
it is the Lord. Now, we don't know if he physically saw him, if he could identify the guy on the beach as the Lord, or was it because he remembered from before? He remembered from before and said, wait a minute, the last time this happened? Yeah, it was Jesus who told us to put the nets out. Maybe. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garments on, for he was stripped for work, and cast himself into the sea. Now, this is another thing that's kind of odd. Usually, when you're jumping into the water, do you put clothes on or take them off? Yeah, usually take them off kind of thing. And they would have taken off their, their outer clothing for work because here they're pulling in nets and everything else and, and their, their clothing is very f- free-flowing, so you don't want that um, in the way. And, um, but, but there's such a respect for people they honor that what they would do is you would, if you're going to be in front of someone that you respect and honor, you would actually put clothes on to show respect to that person. So that's what Peter's doing here. It's the Lord. Oh, it's the Lord. Someone I respect and honor. What do I need to do? I need to put clothes on. Yeah, the water is immaterial. <laughs> You know, who cares that there's water there? On the other side of this water is the Lord, and I'm going to see him, and therefore I need to put, I need to show my respect and my honor for who he is. So it seems odd in the story to put clothes on, but in their culture, it was a way of showing respect and honor. It was, it would just make it, we know it, it would make it a little tougher getting there, going through the water. So he goes on to say, in verse 8, but the, other disciple, uh, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, and it was about 200 cubits away, dragging the net full of fish. So 200 cubits, that's about 100 yards, so it's a football field away. Um, the little boat, that gives you a clue that lots of times the way that they would fish is with two boats. They were a bigger boat and a little boat. And they would put in the little boat a couple guys, and they would have the net. And then and the end of the net would be on the big boat. And they would paddle out from the big boat kind of in a U shape. And they would put out the net as they were going along. And they would get to the end of the net. And then they would make their way back around in a U shape back to the big boat. And when they got there, then the guys grabbed the end of the net. And it was like a seine. And you would just pull all this back into the big boat. And you would have a whatever fish were in the net. So in this little boat, in this little boat, they're about 200 yards from there. So when they got out, of the, out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in, in, in place and fish placed on it and bread. Now here's our second one. Remember number two, a charcoal fire. We had just read about this. When was the last time, or it could have been very close to the last time, that Peter was around a charcoal fire. And if you go back to John chapter 18, verse 18, it says, Now the slaves and the officers are standing there, having made them a charcoal fire. For it was cold, and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. So what's that scene? That's the scene when Peter does what to Jesus? He denies him three times. So now he's in front of another charcoal fire, but who is at this charcoal fire. Jesus is at this charcoal fire. So there's another remembrance for him. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And for fishermen, you know that the, the best fish is the what fish? The fresh fish. Yeah. You want some of the fresh fish that you've just caught. Verse 11, Simon Peter went out and drew up the net uh, to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Now, the first time that they caught the fish, remember the nets were beginning to break, but this time the nets did not break. And being a fisherman, I love to fish, being a fisherman, I just look at this and I go, like a fisherman is telling you this story because they're going to tell you what, what's the size of the fish. So it's a large fish. These are large fish. They're not little fish. These are large fish. And then he's going to tell you how many. 
153. They would have counted them to take them to market, but it, that would have been a process that, you know, because, you know, the other fishermen would say, how many did you get? How many did you get? 153. What? Yeah. And then the amazing part of it, it and yeah, with that many fish that large, the net did not break. Whoa. So any fisherman reading this would have went, whoa, this is amazing. And so I always look at this and go, you know, this is, this is fisherman facts. And so that leads to another story. Because I love to fish. And I think anything, the closest I could get to this was I would, many times we would fish this uh, northern lake, backwaters of the Asabo River. And many times I was out there all by myself. I, we would spend all of our vacations just fishing. That's what I would do. Morning and night, moon, noon and night, morning and noon and night. And I remember being out, I can't remember if it was a morning or a night, and I was by myself, and you could only have two lines. So what I would do is I would put one type of uh, uh, attraction on this one and a different on this. So, so like this line, I had a bobber on the end of it. So I could throw that out and watch that bobber, while this line, I had a casting reel, and I would cast for bass on this one. Well, I had that one all the way out to the lily pads because I was catching these slabs of bluegill, 10 to 12 inches long. I mean, when those things got on there, it was like a whale that you were pulling in and everything. So I'm watching the bobber all the way across there like that, and I'm casting on this one like this, and all of a sudden, boom, the bobber went down. I grabbed, boom, set that hook, and right when I did that, boom, got one on this end. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, what do, I, what do I do here? I'm assuming that this one is bigger than this one I'm, because of the way I'm fishing. I'm assuming, so I like a little tuck. Yeah, I got that. So I stuck it in between my knees like that, and I, I kept reeling and reeling and reeling, bringing this, grabbed the net over here. I mean, I was doing a, this is like yoga. Like, you know, I was... I, <laughs> I got that fish in there, boom, picked this up, this one, brought that one all the way in and everything. Yeah, that's a fisherman. I mean, I'm going to tell that story till I die, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And I got both of them. I got both of them into the boat. I think that's what's happening here. John, who's a fisherman, is uh, appealing to all the other fishermen, and he just tells them how great the, the, the details of this that made this stand out. Um... I will come back to that. Verse 12. Jesus said to them, come have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to question him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. So they, they physically knew that this was the Lord before him. He came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and the fish likewise. Here's another remembrance. This has happened before. A meal of bread and fish. John chapter, chapter 6 verse 11 and you can probably guess where this, is, where this has happened before. Jesus took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, and likewise also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the leftover pieces so that none will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with pieces of five barley loaves left over for those who had eaten. Where did it happen before? The feeding of the 5,000. So here's another remembrance of what Jesus was feeding them was what he has fed them before. Now this was, verse 14, this was the third time that Jesus manifested or made himself visible to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So in John's recording of this, he records the first time was Easter Sunday evening when he met with the twelve in the locked room. And then the second time is about a, a week later, the next Sunday, when Thomas is also with them, and he says, put your hand here and put your hand here, and you know, don't be unbelieving, but believe. Now here's the third time that he records. Verse 15, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, and notice there again, both names, but when Jesus says it, he says, Simon, son of John. So Peter goes, or Jesus goes back to his birth name, Simon, son of John. He doesn't call him Peter at this point. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The word for love he uses in the Greek is agape. It means unconditional love. So Jesus is saying, do you unconditionally love me more than these? Now, some people say, was he talking about the fish or was he talking about the guys that were around the campfire? I think he's talking about the guys around the campfire in the context of what he asked Peter to do. 
But do you unconditionally love me more than these guys around the campfire? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, what Peter does is he changes the word. It's still the word love in our sense, but it's phileo love. And that's a brotherly love. A brother, br we're, I love you as a brother. So Jesus says, do you unconditionally love me? Peter responds back, I love you like a brother. You know, I love you like a brother. Now, he didn't answer the same way that Jesus asked. But notice what happens next. He said to him, Jesus said to Peter, Yes, Lord. Or he said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. So even though Peter didn't answer back the way that Jesus asked him, he still gave him this instruction. That word for tend there means to actually feed. And he says, feed my lambs, meaning little ones. So he's telling Peter, make sure, one of the things I want you to make sure that you do, as a leader of the church, because that's what he's destined to be, I want you to make sure that you feed the little ones, the ones that are immature, the ones that are new. Make sure that's a specific group. He says, make sure that the ones, and I would take this for, for, forward, the ones that are new to the faith, make sure that you feed them. Make sure that they get my words. Help them to grow. So that's what he tells them, the first thing he tells them to do. Verse 16, he said to him a second time, Jesus did, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you unconditionally love me? And he said to him, Peter said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I brotherly love you. I love you like a brother. So he does the same thing again. Answers the same way again. He said to him, notice again, he didn't answer the way that Jesus asked. But Jesus continues on with this instruction on what he wants Peter to do. He says, shepherd my sheep. He uses a different word there. Shepherd means that you tend or care for the flock. I mean, not just feeding them as a shepherd would make sure that they got food, but everything about a sheep. So they caring for their physical needs, making sure they got here and there and everything else. So it was the total care of the flock. So he goes from something specific saying, Peter, make sure to feed the little ones, the ones that are new in Christ. But also, I want you to care for the whole flock, the whole big flock. There's a lot of needs in the flock. Make sure to care for the flock. Then he goes on, verse 17. Now he said the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, that third time, here's a, another remembrance, a third time. You can't help but think that Peter's thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> I denied him three times, and now here's a third time. He is asking me about my love for him. Now, when Jesus does it this third time, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Um, he changes the word there. He doesn't say, do you unconditionally love me? He goes to the word that Peter has been using. He says, do you brotherly love me? Do you brotherly love me? And I think that's why it says next, Peter was grieved. Peter was grieved. And so, because he said a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And again, now he answered in agreement with what Jesus just asked because Jesus changed the word. But he goes on and he gives him one more instruction to do as a leader of the church that would come into being. He says, tend my sheep. And so he goes back to that concept of feeding that specific part of it feeding but now he says sheep not just the little ones not just the lambs not just the ones that are new in the faith but make sure that you feed those that are mature in the faith too and if you just stop right there and you just go like yeah that's what well, that's what shepherds under shepherds of christ do that's what elders do that's what pastors do we we are under the same commission as peter that we are to feed the new ones, the ones that are new in the faith, that they might grow up in this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to care for the whole body. 
And it, it, it goes beyond just the feeding part, but the physical needs and the spiritual needs and, the, and all those things. And, and man, that, I tell you, that's so immense that you need to pray daily for your elders and for your pastor because of that responsibility. And then that last one, to make sure to feed the flock. Make sure to feed, make sure that the mature ones hear God's word over and over and over again. I, I point those out because Peter really isn't answering the questions the way that Jesus wants them answered. But what is Jesus still doing? He's still giving him instruction on what to do. So verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk around as you wished. You were in control, Peter. That's what you thought. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Yeah, when you get old, you'll realize somebody else is in charge. And the stretch out of hands, that's code word again for the crucifixion. John gives us commentary in verse 19. Now he said this, signifying what kind of death. So if they talked about the stretching out of the arms, that signified that kind of death that he would die by crucifixion. Uh, but he says this kind of death, he would glorify God. So in his death, he's telling him he's going to die by crucifixion, but he's telling Peter ahead of time that you are going to glorify me in your death. You're, you're, you're going to die this way, but you are going to stay true to God in this. Uh, church history tells us that he was crucified and and he did not feel worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. And therefore, instead of being crucified upright, he was crucified upside down. Just because he treasured his Lord so much that he would put outer clothing on and jump into the water to, to go meet him. And when he, had, um, when he had said this, spoken this, he said to him, now listen to this, follow me, follow me. Now, this is a, remember number five, five, follow me. So we go back to Matthew chapter, chapter four. Again, going back about three, three and a half years when he first met Jesus. And those first encounters with him. And in Matthew chapter four, uh, starting with verse 18, it says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I want to point out here that it seems like Peter has done a couple face plants. I mean, when it, definitely when he denied Christ. Boom, I mean, just, he just failed. Um, he went out weeping. He was remorse over it. Now, here's another situation where Jesus is specifically asking him a certain way, and he answers it differently. But even, and it would look like a face plant, like he's failed, but at the same time, Jesus continues to give him instruction on what to do, and he finalizes it with this, follow me. Now get ready for another face plant of Peter. Verse 20, Peter turning around, that's always bad. Yeah. It's always bad when he turns around. He, so what did he do? He took his eyes off Jesus, didn't he? Remember when Jesus is walking on the water? And, and G, Peter says, if it's you, tell me, come on out. And, and Jesus, come on out. And he walks on the water, and he's fine until he what? Until he takes his eyes off of Jesus. He's doing the same thing right here. Has Peter learned anything? Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's code word for John. Following them. So you kind of get this idea that Jesus and, and Peter are kind of walking along as they're having this conversation. And then there's somebody behind them, and it's John. John's been following, probably listening in on what's going on. The disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had said he leaned back on the bosom at supper, and the Lord who was... The one who is the one who will betray you. So he identifies himself. We know that G John is the one that did that. John was asked by Peter, ask him who's going to betray him. And, and we read that in the scriptures that he laid his bosom against Jesus' bosom and asked them that question. So he clearly identifies himself. Verse 21, so Peter seeing him said to Jesus, 
Lord, and what about this man? Yeah, face plant. He does it again. Uh, some might say that, well, maybe he had such affection for John, but I don't think so. And not the way that Jesus responds. I think he, he, he was just like, he just found out that he was going to die by crucifixion. And, 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 and it wasn't going to be so well. But, it, but, but all he does is he turns around and he points to somebody else. What about him? What about him? And that, you know, we can do that, can't we? We can, we, can, we can point to other people. Say, what about them? Why do I have to go through this? Why, why not them? What's going to happen to them? So verse 22, Jesus said to him, if I, want, if I want him to remain until I come, in that phrase there, Jesus is telling Peter, I'm in control, not you. What is that to you? And then he comes back to it. You follow me you keep your eyes on me don't look at somebody else don't get sidetracked you keep following me now john clears this up he says therefore this saying went out among the brothers that this disciple meaning himself would not die Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until he comes, what is that to you? So John wants to make sure that his readers know accurately that, that Jesus did not say that this disciple whom he loved, John, would never die. He's, he's saying, no, 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 that's not what he said. He said, if I wanted, and it was Jesus who said, if I want him to, not that he was going to. I, I just think that's really interesting that the Bible wants us to have it accurately. The Bible helps us to see it, wants it accurately so that we can interpret it accurately. Then he finishes with this. He says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness. So Jesus bore witness of God and he told his disciples to bear witness. So he is bearing witness of these things and wrote these things and we know that his witness is true and that we is like the Queen of England. You know how the Queen of England never says I? She always says we, even though she means I. That's what, Peter, or what John's doing there. And there are so many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written one after another, I suppose even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That gives you a clue that when John writes his gospel, what he's doing is he's writing selectively, not exhaustively. Okay? He's writing selectively, not exhaustively, because he just told you if he, if he was able to write exhaustively about Jesus and everything that he said and done, he said, I, I'm, I'm sure I couldn't find enough books to write all this down. So he wrote it selectively. And that gives you a cue, as I said last Sunday, to go back through the Gospel of John and read it that way that, wait a minute, John has specifically given us these instances so that we would what? What's our word? Believe. That we would believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he doesn't write, he writes selectively, not exhaustively, but he also writes in a way that he exhibits that this Jesus is overwhelming. He is overwhelming. He is just unbelievable. And that takes me back to the, the, the fishing facts. As he told you about the fishing facts, about the full of large fish and, and 153, and the nets didn't break. And it was just unbelievable kind of thing. He ends it with like, but Jesus is even greater than that. Jesus is just unbelievable overwhelming this one that's named Jesus. So I give you um, three points here to, to finish with to apply to our lives. First, number one is we bear witness of, of the risen Jesus. We bear witness of the risen Jesus. So just as, as Jesus bore witness to God, is God with us? And the disciples bear witness to the risen Lord that we also bear witness now of that risen Lord. Secondly, second one is we are to follow him. It's a simple instruction. Follow him. 
We will be tempted to look to our left or our right. But Jesus' instruction is the same to Peter as it was in the beginning, as was in the end, that we are to follow him. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that was the instruction given to you at the start of your rebirth in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you were to repent of your sins and receive him in faith, the first instruction is to be obedient unto him. Follow me. And it's still the same today. No matter where you are on that journey, it's still the same today that you are to follow after him. And then the third one is that we are to continue to follow the one who has called us. Because you've noticed here that Peter has done some face plants. He's, he's fallen on his face. He's put his foot in his mouth. He's, he does all this kind of stuff. But he was called by Jesus. And there will be times in our lives where we will do face plants. Where we will say things that we should not say. We shouldn't have said. We will do things that we should not have done. We will look away from Jesus. And we'll put our attention on something else. We'll do just like what Peter did. And that we need to continue to follow the one who's called us. And so if you're in that place at any time, you feel like you've done a face plant, you feel like you've taken your eyes off of Jesus, know that the response back to you is just the same. He's going to say the same exact words to you if you are called of him. He's going to say, follow me, Joyce. Follow me. It doesn't change. Victor, it doesn't change. Follow me. But Lord, I messed up and I denied you and I did this and that and the other thing and, and all that kind of stuff. And he'll say, he'll say to you, wait, follow me, follow me. You're not going to get any other answer out of me. <laughs> and you say, okay. And I am thankful that the rest of the story here is that does Peter follow him? Yes, he does. He follows him all the way to a cross and does not deny him. And even though there are some more face plants of Peter in the book of Acts, he continues to get back up and follow him. So much so that I'll end with this. In 2 Peter, and what I love about 1 and 2 Peter is you get to read Peter later reflecting back onto what has been said. And you get this sense that, wait a minute, he got it. He got it. So if you go to 2 Peter, and you go to um, I don't know, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. He says, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. I will always be ready to remind you of these things. What's he doing? He's feeding the sheep. He's feeding the lambs. He always wants to remind them of, what, of these things. Even though you already know them. So he's, he's telling this even to those that are mature in the faith. He's telling them over again. And have been strengthened in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling. As long as I'm alive. To stir you up by way of reminder. I mean, until my dying breath, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. See, is Peter, did Peter get it? Yeah, he, he got it. Then he says, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. He's saying, I'm going to die someday. But then the next line, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has indicated to me. Did he remember it? Yeah. He remembered the words that Jesus said to him on that seashore at that breakfast on the seashore at the charcoal fire and telling him, this is how you will die someday. Someone's going to stretch out your arms. But in your death, you are going to glorify me. And here Peter, later on, as he's feeding the sheep, he's saying, you know, as the Lord Jesus indicated to me, he's not in charge anymore. He's not saying, this is how it's going to happen. He's saying, no, no, as the Lord Jesus said, that's how it's going to happen. Verse 15, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, 
you will be able to call these things to mind. Because the way I've lived my life and taught you from the scriptures that even after my departure, you now would pull these things into mind so that you would continue to do what? Follow him. Follow him. So, this morning, I, I thank you for the opportunity to walk through passages of Scripture with you. It has truly been a pleasure. Um, I hope if in any way, shape, or form that you have fallen more in love with the Word of God. Um, because I do every, every week. I get so excited about what I get to read and how Jesus interacts with his disciples and how we now stand in those places and he's interacting with us. I would encourage you that if there are times when you have felt as a called person, as one who's saved, but you have fallen flat on your face and you feel discouraged and you feel like Jesus probably doesn't want me anymore. Well, I mean, what, what use am I? Look what I, I messed up. Man, did I mess that up. That if you're called of God, he's going to say the same thing to you as I would say to you. Follow him. Get back up and follow him. And continue to tell to your dying breath that Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of our lives. So we're going to finish our service with one more song. And uh, this is a very fitting song in a couple different ways. Yeah, Steph, come on up. Um, is that, of course... I'm sure that on your minds has been Debbie Mamoni. And you've been praying for her as she walks through these, this time of cancer. And, um, and so this morning, I'm, we're not singing this in dedication of her. But I do want us to sing this in relationship to thinking of her as she is speaking these words to her Lord during this time of her life. Um, but it is a great song that Peter finally got to the point where he said, yet not I. No, it's not me anymore. No, he's in charge. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Peter could say those words. So would you stand and let's sing this song to the Lord. And if you would, uh, you know, yes, breathe a prayer of, 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 uh, for Debbie Mamoni this morning, but also think of her as she echoes these words every day now to her Heavenly Father.